There you go full screen with this. So we're picking up here from Microsoft Windows assembly with MASM, AKA MASM 32, and going by the Jeff Wang, if you type in Win ASM Tut into a search engine, one of the top results should be this Windows Assembly Programming Tutorial with this PDF file, Win ASM Tut. And I'm going to click on that. You can see Jeff Wang, um, December 10th, 2003, but still very relevant and still just as buggy and quirky as it was back then. And then if I scroll way down here, the previous videos cover the previous parts of this, the essential parts of this. Okay, and so when we get here to this chapter five section, it's only a 17 page little write up, but it covers a lot of the good essentials to like get down for assembly language programming in Windows. So right here, we're on the file management part, which also has a lot of overlap with the memory part, like allocating memory. So in the old DOS world, which is what this is kind of, you know, early 2000s. So it was only basically a decade after the DOS Windows 16 bit era. Um, so I'm going to kind of show you how you can, although using this tutorial and using it as a springboard of maybe what to practice and study for the core essential stuff, it also is outdated and wrong in some regards. So I've been trying to kind of brush up and pick up on that stuff as I go along here. So the main things it's talking about for file management are the Windows API functions, create file, read file, write file, and close handle. Um, with create file, don't think of it necessarily as creating a new file thing. It should have been called like create file, excuse me, create file object would have probably been a better name for it because that's exactly what it does, or create file handle even. But what it does is return an, a, han a handle to an object that is a file object. Not necessarily a quote unquote object oriented programming object, but a memory object. And read file, of course, reads the file. Write file, which I'm not gonna cover right now, of course, writes the file, and then close handle will basically close that file object that you returned right there. So those are the core Windows API file handling things. And then we get over here to memory where he basically used this to uh, brush the basics on how to open a file, allocate some memory, read that file into the chunks of memory and then display it in a message box. So I was gonna do the same thing and if we go down here, so I, what I did is I already typed it. I was like, okay, I'm going to practice it out, type it out, and then erase it, live code it, which I've pretty much been doing for the most part with the past tutorials, but they seem to go on for like an hour or two. So I thought, well, maybe I'll just leave this one typed out and just sort of describe it and see if maybe I can knock it out in 20 or 30 minutes. We'll see. Um, so right here he has the, the top boilerplate stuff which is the 386, the instruction set it's going to use, the memory model, the calling convention. Let me zoom this in a little bit. So we have the, uh, the instruction set, which means you can use up through the 386 instruction set, which I still use that because, you know, you can do dot .686 or whatever, but just to demonstrate that I'm boxing myself in and, you know, not doing anything that you couldn't do 30 years ago, basically. And that it also, that all that stuff still works just the same. Um, model memory flat, standard call. This is all like pretty much stereotypical. And the option case map none is just because uh, the old MASMs would want to, and even obviously the newer ones, they'd want to like try and uppercase names and stuff to do with like Pascal and basic compatibility, I guess. So anyway, this just tells it, hey, don't screw with the casing of identifiers and stuff. And then these include files. I don't use the MAS, these are the MASM32 include files. There's all sorts of variations. If you're using MASM32 or you have access to some compatible include files or whatever, of course, you're welcome to use those. 
I just go ahead and I go ahead and use these include lib statements right here and then right under them I just manually import the very few functions that I need instead of doing these which bring in just everything that they possibly can. One benefit of the way that I do it is not only does it expose what's really going on under the hood more but it also is easier if you go in and debug because if you try and look at like generated source listings and stuff they can like as soon as you include these three files right here they're just like unmanageable because it dumps in so many symbols and stuff. But anyway, then you get down here. So I would actually call, oh, he does call those usual suspects. I was going to say, I, I thought he was calling this the usual suspects, but he's calling this stuff that, which makes sense. Um, one thing about this page to note is that he describes everything, speaking of that, underneath it, which personally I prefer that somebody says the following are like the usual suspects. So right here, we define our string and declare four variables to be used later on, which is actually this. You're going to see very quickly that I deviate from what he's doing, but for the most part, I'm doing virtually the same thing he is, but I'm just doing it a little bit more my own way and a little bit in a way that I consider the more modern way. Um, like I said, he was kind of leaning towards that 16-bit Windows way, and we are obviously in an entirely different era where we're talking about 32-bit Windows and, you know, running this probably most likely on a 64-bit operating system, right? Which doesn't really make a difference for our code, but um, the fact that we're leaning 3264 instead of 1632. So anyway, if you have this file or you're following along or whatever, good. I think I can, for the most part, just shrink this down now and get away from here. So things like this memory size, whatever, I guess I'll just skim over his thing and just kind of give it a quick little rant review to uh, put it into perspective. So data, file name, DB, uh, test, text, this is a narrow ANSI string, not a Unicode one, just something to note. And he's defining it in data, but I define it in const because it's not going to change, right? So it's just like if you would define like a global const in a C programming language or similar, then that's what I did. So by him doing data, that means that this file name variable could potentially, you know, that pointer could change and it could point to a different string or that, you know, maybe we could mutate this string or something like that. So I go ahead and define it in const, which should put this in immutable memory, in an immutable memory segment, so that all that stays more constant. And then this data question mark that he does, I go ahead and define that stuff in the regular data section because data question mark means you can say like you know I'm gonna have this identifier and it's gonna be of this type and uh, it's uninitialized so it's gonna have whatever random values that were in that those bytes of memory before you allocated them for this program so I thought you know what maybe it'd be better to go ahead and nullify the, like null those out and just make them zero that memory out so I went ahead and put that in the data thing and then just put a zero instead of a question mark so that was something I did different the way that I did it is going to take the slightest bit more processing time technically where this would be more like an optimization because there's no initialization necessary but the way I did it is also arguably slightly safer because then you're going to get this null value return instead of who knows what you know what type of memory or what it's going to write to all right and then we get down here and he starts the code with the typical start label which is all cool and then he uses these invoke things so this is actually that's all a, a function call to a windows api function right create file which like i just mentioned it probably better named create file object but this is just one of those legacy deals that we're kind of stuck with. So um, the invoke is an MASM specific high level type of a construct. So a lot of times I prefer to just not use invoke. It can be handy. Like if you're translating code over from a high level language, I would suggest using invoke in that scenario and then going back and just using low level call syntax for specific things where you need to make specific little optimizations or want a little bit more specific control but that being said you do have a lot of control with invoke if you so choose um it doesn't 
the syntax and some of the ideas behind it don't necessarily translate directly like if you're gonna go use NASM or some other assembler so that's another reason plus I just like to you know especially for what I'm doing right now I like to just demonstrate how uh, what really goes on generically speaking with the assembly language but anyway all that being said if you notice this is a huge call like for one thing in modern times I think we all like anybody who's good on design patterns or just like good object oriented or just any kind of good programming modular whatever design is not going to pass this many variables to a function if you're passing more than a very few like some people say four parameters some people say three whatever I'm talking a very few like four max if you're passing any more parameters than that to a function that then that's a code smell you know what I mean you might as well just pit all those in an object or some other type of structure and pass a reference to that structure and fill that structure out somewhere else you know because otherwise it's like it's just like this where it's wrapping around to a whole nother line and it's like what does this null mean you know stuff like that it's just not descriptive so anyway like in modern days that's bad practice and even this invoke versus the call um, invoke can kind of do them all in one line and it's not helping you know it's it's all that so I'm gonna basically call this same create file function but I'm gonna use a regular old call uh, keyword here instead of this MSM construct and I'm gonna pass it what is effectively the same exact values and then we come down here and what they're what he's doing here I'm gonna get turn all this I'm not gonna call any of these functions I'm which is just these two functions global alloc and global lock I'm not gonna call those I'm just gonna call a regular old malloc for memory allocation and C if you're familiar I'm just gonna call that here because these are holdovers from win 16 they don't really have anything to do with 32-bit or beyond Windows programming this was just a thing sort of a pattern you had to use with the 16-bit windows to sort of because of segmentation and uh, all that kind of stuff back then that sort of re necessitated using this kind of stuff but now the recommended way if you look in the Windows API documentation here which I will open up so I'll even open up the old Windows API this is like mid 90s Windows API documentation there's malloc let's see maybe if I list topics on that standard C Windows 32 processes which is even if you have 64-bit Windows we're you know um, it's compatible with Windows 32 and specifically we're using Windows 32 but for the most part all the Windows API stuff for the most part is going to be virtually identical um, Windows 32 processes can safely use the standard C library functions malloc, free, and so on to manipulate memory when used with previous versions of Windows. I think I can make this bigger. Maybe not. Uh, when used with previous versions of Windows, these functions had potential problems that no longer apply to applications using the Win32 API. For example, malloc allocates a fixed pointer that does not take advantage of movable memory. Memory management is no longer a problem because the system is free to manage memory by moving pages of physical memory without affecting the virtual addresses. Similarly, the distinction between near and far pointers is no longer relevant. So unless you want to allocate discardable memory, it's now reasonable to use the standard C library functions for memory management. And there's other, I mean, so it basically comes down to like what memory functions you use. Like there's the global alloc, local alloc, then there's these virtual alloc, all that kind of stuff, and virtual free. Um, maybe there's a reason you can go and click into these and see like, you know, the heap create function creates heap objects that can be used by the calling process. The function reserves contiguous block and virtual memory address space of the process and allocates physical storage for a specified initial portion of this block. So, if for some reason you know go in there read that read the remarks like creates private heap you know um maybe you'll read something in here that is like oh yeah i need that feature of this particular function call if you don't notice that if you read this and you're like yeah it looks like i could use it for what i want to do but i don't see anything special that goes above and beyond malloc and free that i need then just stick to malloc and free that's the recommended way to do it with Windows 32 and therefore Windows 64 programming. 
so all that being said let's see here if there was anything else and that's less code to deal with too and then uh we don't have to lock it we just call malloc and we get this pointer to memory right away and then we go ahead and read file a lot like this and message box and then instead of doing global unlock and global free we just call free and then of course we still need to close the handle ideally and exit process and that's that and that's what i'm going to cover right now so i've already coded this out so you don't have to watch me type it all slow and everything so 386 memory model da, 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 and then include lib cmasm32 lib kernel32 ideally if you're using like visual studio 2019 tools or uh, visual the uh, 7.1 sdk which is my favorite personally then you probably don't have to type you don't this will probably just give you an error with that in there so you can get rid of that but if you are using masm32 and it's not you haven't set the lib path properly then you'll need to prefix it with the specific path um, pitting lib at the end of the file name is optional there and so I should be able to get rid of it there too and then I just these can go these prototypes can go anywhere they're normally in those ink files but I just went ahead and typed them under the respective include files that they belong to to sort of illustrate that better so exit process pretty much every program is going to use that that just kind of like return zero and high level C programming. This create file ANSI version is going to take a narrow string to create that file object. Read file reads it in, close handle, all those self-explanatory. Here's the include lib bringing in from uh, Microsoft Visual C runtime. There's a few other options there, but in general, that's pretty much, that's the one to use. Um, and it's going to, of course, bring in malloc and free. But right here, if you notice right after we're proto, I have the letter C which is the language type uh, for the calling convention. So normally it's going to default to this standard call, but this tells it, hey, wait a minute, for these two functions, they are standard C functions, not standard call functions. So use that C calling convention, which means that the caller of the function, not the function itself, uh, does what's called cleaning the stack. And cleaning the stack basically means cleaning the the parameters that were passed to the stack no matter what the function itself will clean the portion of the stack that has to do with like local variables and stuff like that but in this situation whenever you hear to just generically generally speaking if you hear of cleaning the stack it's just wiping off those past parameters the cool thing with standard call is if you do that you can just as part of the ret ret statement you can just um, if you're writing your own function and this is the way that most all the Windows functions do it too, is they just, that ret statement, you can just wipe the parameters off right there, then and there in one spot and get rid of it. But with C, you have to, the calling function does it. It's just one more little statement. Um, the benefit of the calling function doing that is that you can pass variable parameters. So that, and then of course, user 32, we got to import for the message box. Anything that's like Windows, Windows, you know, like visual Windows, that's most likely going to be in user 32. So a message box is, you know, it's not something you'd expect to see at the console or going on behind the scenes. So that's why that one's brought in. And then, like I said, data, I only brought in these three variables. So which one am I missing here? The handle to memory is not needed because we're not doing those two calls for global alloc and uh, what is it? and uh, global lock we're not doing it in two steps we're doing it one so we can eliminate one of those variables like I said here I have the file name as a const I'm gonna go ahead and use this uh, this is basically the KJV Bible text just as a large text example I don't necessarily um, not trying to push that on anybody specifically and I don't even completely agree with this exact rendition of that text the way it's done but that being said that's what that is and then we start the code right here and so this in case you're not quite familiar this is the I guess you might say old-fashioned way or just the standard way of making a call in x86 assembly language uh, at least in 32-bit x86 assembly language where you push the variables in reverse order the parameters onto the stack and then you call that function and then if you want to save the results of that call 
you copy whatever's left in EAX into your variable name. So it's basically just like the C thing, but exactly flipped and reversed. Like this would be like H file equals create file A, and then this is the first parameter, this is the second parameter, and so on, like that. So, however, it helps to think of that if you want to think of it like, I, I just in general try and think of it like the first parameter is going to be closest to the function name to remember that ordering. And so each one of these little blocks right here is a function call. You know, all this is pushing all the values to the stack, all the parameters to the stack, calling it, storing that value if need be. And the same thing right here, pushing it, pushing the value, call malloc. And since malloc was that C function and we're required for cleaning the parameters off the stack, right there, that's what that is, is just subtracting four bytes from the stack pointer. And you might think off the top of your head, uh, if you are familiar with the way the stack works, is that I'm pushing on a value and it's going to move the stack pointer enough to hold that value, just enough to hold that value, then it's going to copy that value to that position on the stack and move on with its life. But this value isn't 65, 536, that sounds like a 16-bit value. And that's how many values, how many unique units, um, the word's escaping me right now, but that's the amount of values that a 16-bit value can represent, 65,536. But that is the, the values 0 through 65535. So we're technically going one beyond that by saying 65536. So that means that if we had gone one shorter to 65535, then it would only allocate, it would only push a word, a 16 bit word value onto the stack because it can fit that within that 16 bit representation. But since I'm going one over, it's going to bump that up and go, okay, I'm going to round up to a D word then. So it's going to actually treat that as a 32 bit value. And if I'm not mistaken, that seems to be the way that this is working. So that's why I'm subtracting four bytes, which is equal to 32 bits, even though it looks like it is borderline a 16 bit value there. And that just cleans that parameter off the stack. Because since this is that, like I said, this is that standard C call. This is a Windows API standard call. I shouldn't call it standard C maybe because it's not part of the standard. It's just the common calling convention. So this one, uh, Microsoft was smart enough to say, hey, maybe it's better, more efficient if we just clean those parameters off in the function itself when we can. But this was the old fashioned way where they said, hey, we want to make sure that people, you know, can, uh, do variable parameters like printf takes variable parameters stuff like that so they leave it up to us so we get this one little crufty cleanup and then if we want p memory to equal that result that is returned from malloc then we just copy whatever's in eax after it's done into p memory so just like i was saying that's kind of like p memory equals malloc with the one parameter 65536 passed to it and that number is kind of arbitrary right now like you could change that for sure this is just saying allocate that much memory. That's sort of like our little window of how much bytes of text we're going to deal with at a time. So then we get down here to the next call, the read file call, and pass all the parameters onto the stack there, and call that to read the file in. And you can see we're passing the offset of read size, which is a globally allocated read size up here. So that's why we're passing the offset. He uses adder because he's using the invoke thing. Um, I believe you should just be able to use offset in that function. You could change it out if you're sticking to his style as well. And then we're going to pass the offset to the file name for the title of the message box and the pointer to the text in memory and call the message box with the narrow string message box version, the A version, which if you're used to programming in C or maybe you use the uh, Unicode flag or whatever, then you might not see be familiar with that A, but I prefer to specifically call the ANSI or the wide word Unicode character function, whichever one I'm using. And then finally, we want to free up that memory 
and then because that's a C call, clean that stack. We don't care about the return value. Then we call the Windows API function to close the handle to the file, and we don't care about that return result necessarily. And then we go ahead and push zero for kind of this is basically like return zero, right? So up here, these little magic numbers, that's the uh, that big ugly create the create file object function. So these, if you were to dig into like winbase.h and uh, winnt.h, in the newest versions of the Windows SDK, I think it's in uh, fileapi.h. So you'll find these magic numbers instead of the constants that he used, like generic read, file share read, open existing, file attribute normal. So this is basically, that's a null. This is gonna be your uh, file attribute normal. This is gonna be open existing. That's gonna be null. This is gonna be file share read. And this is gonna be generic read. And you can see the ones that are hexadecimal, I did the little H after. Some of the values just look prettier as hexadecimal, so I stuck with that. These single digit values here that are single numeric digits, you could put an H after them or whatever because they're the same in hexadecimal or decimal. And I think all that's that. So if we call this what we should, it should do exactly what it seems like it's gonna do. It's going to create a file object it's going to allocate some memory. So this is just basically a reference to that file on the disk, which I've passed it an absolute path to, followed by a null zero. Because that's a string, we're passing it a string, and you know, especially in Windows, unless otherwise stated, it's going to expect that null terminating zero. And then we're going to read in up to this many bytes at a time, which you can see right here I've passed in. This is for the offset to the red size and this is the read size and then the memory to store it in which we'd allocated right there and this is the file to read so I think that should about explain that as far as one way to find those um, these values of this these magic numbers if you need them is to go like we can just go create file and then click on create file A here and there's the explanation and we come down a little bit and we can see maybe I'll zoom in if it'll let me it's being a little bit slow okay so handle create file A you can see long pointers a D word D word D word LP long pointer D word D word D word handles 32-bit windows D word so that's why if you come up here where I've declared these create file a D word 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 I just for every parameter that there is in this prototype here I just I mean they're all D words 99% of the time and those will explain the the suggested name over here that they use for the variable values kind of help explain a little bit what it is and then right here parameters LP file name as you can see, lines up with that first parameter LP file name there, the name or file device. This is a little trick to get around the max path. Um, what does it say? Unicode versions of this function, you can opt to remove max path without prepending that. So if you follow this, your stuff's only, oh, I'm using Windows 8.1, and in this virtual machine, I'm using Windows XP Service Pack 3. So I would suggest not, if you're planning on distributing an application, yeah, the vast majority of people might have Windows 10, but there's always those people that don't, you know? So do you really care about that little convenience or would you rather just prepen this and know that you can go all the way back at least through Windows XP and have total compatibility? To this day, I would say like still program for XP compatibility. I usually target Windows 2000 within reason, you know, and then I'm a weirdo, so I'll actually go back and try and get my stuff to run on Windows NT 351. But uh, I think Windows 2000 is a reasonable target. And if there's something where you're like, oh man, I'd have to write like a whole nother block or page of code or something to make this work with Windows 2000 or add all these 
conditions or something, then okay, yeah, there's probably little to no people that are likely to be running Windows 2000 that are going to run your thing. But XP Service Pack 3, I feel like there's still a lot of computers in the wild that are running that. And also there's a lot of computers collecting dust that are running that. So, you know, especially in a day and age when people talk about being green and all that, if we're writing software that only runs on the newest devices how green is that you know what i mean if you write an app that only works on the latest iphones like then what people gotta chuck their old iphones and buy new ones i'm just i've never been about that because as you know not quite as privileged as some people might think growing up kid i had a computer and i felt like that was a privilege but it was always slower than everybody else who had a computer. You know, there were a lot of kids who didn't have a PC growing up. I did, but mine was slower than all theirs. So that made me really good at optimizing stuff. Like I worked as a computer repair person before the Geek Squad or any of that junk. And I, uh, I, I was really good. I could just optimize computers to be really fast because I knew all the spots to trim all the fat and everything. So. That I felt like that was kind of a blessing in disguise because now I've just carried that over and as I've watched computers and operating systems sort of evolve, I've been able to see like for new people coming in, they might not really know. It's just like such a thick of it kind of a thing that you don't know like what's the best way to go, you know? So it's like just ignore most of the Windows 10 and even Windows, I don't even program to Windows 8 even though what I'm using 8.1, right? Um, like I said, I just target all the way back to Windows 2000. I would say at least target back to Windows 7, honestly. And people might try and put up the argument, especially the companies that stand to profit from it, to say, oh, well, Windows 7 technically isn't under general support anymore or anything like that. And it's like, so what? Though, If you look, those operating systems were around for more or less a decade and were receiving regular updates for a decade. So you could basically like look at whatever... Uh, issues might be wrong with them and you can look at them on like one screen full of issues you know of like okay this might not have the newest security certificates or something like that you know like it, but most of the little backdoor kind of bugs and stuff like that mo the vast majority of those have been hammered out and the truth is is that those are in the newest operating systems too we just don't know about them yet you know so the problem is so to speak very well defined on older operating systems I feel like and then there's situations where regardless of what the ideal is there might be institutions still running Windows 7 and it's you know <laughs> that's the way it is for the indefinite future or something so your program will still at least work on there and it's not going to make your program less secure you know it, your code is still going to run for the most part just as efficiently just as securely all that there it's most anything that you need to do is still just as fast and secure, you know. Um, the very newest operating system support like Vector Call, I think that is probably backported in a library to where that's a non-issue and you're not even going to use Vector Call, don't worry. It definitely not in any of the stuff I'm covering. Um, in MASM, you could write your own procedures to even do a Vector Call. I think you might have to. I don't know if they ever even added those. But, uh, yeah, anyway, I just say go back, support the lowest common denominator is what I call it. That's actually, it's not my own term, but that's just a term is to say, hey, support support the lowest common denominator. That used to actually be a thing. When I did have that slow computer back in the day, one of the funny things was if I went out to like the rare event, I might get to buy a game on the PC or something. That game was made for to support PCs that were like 10 plus years old, you know? So it was like horrible graphics, like horrible sound usually, stuff like that. And it was like people would definitely be trying to hit that whole market and know, especially then PCs were like just an average PC was like thousands of dollars, probably brand new. So they knew that people weren't upgrading every few years and stuff. But anyway, just, I don't know. And nowadays computers for like definitely for the last 10 years have been, you know, I'm still using the same old laptop that's was like 300 bucks you know and it still does everything i'm running a machine i'm running an operating system in an operating system on it not even hypervisor mode so not even the most efficiently and it does it fine like 
and I'm not the biggest gamer in the world, so I don't need like necessarily cutting edge 3D graphics, but this has decent 3D capabilities. So it's just to say like, why should I have to throw this out, install Windows 10, have it tracking and tracing me all the time, and you know, taking telemetric data and then using big bloated apps and stuff like that. Like I'm just, I'm using the same Windows API relying on that that's been around for decades and decades and ideally should be supported and around for decades to come. So end rant on that. This is where you can find these uh, symbolic constants and their values and stuff like that. The ones that are used See if I can get back over to the Windows tutorial here. The ones that he uses. One second. Are zoom back in here. Sorry, I'm eating up my little buffer of time that I shouldn't have. Just about done. So, like generic read all this you can go look those up online in that windows api documentation open existing this is all just boilerplate this is all just to say hey open a file for normal reading you know we're not going to write to it uh we don't care if somebody else wants to look at it at the, some other program at the same time as us like that's what all this long-winded function call is just to say that basically and like i said you can just call Melek instead of this and it essentially is the same exact thing and I didn't use the constant for memory size if you notice I did that's that 65 536 I just passed it in you know and he's doing this minus one which doesn't really make sense with the 65 535 because he was already minus one there I don't know I don't know what his reasoning was for that maybe he just was overthinking it or something or maybe I'm underthinking it but yeah, anyway, that's an explanation around that. Maybe that helps clear up what's going on there and shows you a little bit better, in my opinion, more modern way of handling all that stuff. Thanks a lot for watching.